Hey everybody, <laughs> got something <laughs> caught in my nose. Uh, I'm JJ, you're watching Rally Survival, and tonight we are going to answer some of your guys' questions, and we're also going to um, talk a little bit about nuclear power plants. Uh, I see a ton of people that are like freaking out about the fact that they live close to a nuclear power plant, and um, this is really... It's not a big deal. There, there are um, tons and tons and tons and tons of safety uh, mechanisms built into nuclear power plants. And uh, so I wanted to talk about some of those. And, you know, it, I think a lot of this has to do with uh, simplicity bias. And if you remember back from that video that I did a little while ago talking about the different kinds of bias that we all have and all that kind of stuff. Hey, what's going on, Paul? Um, then it's, you know, when you take a subject that maybe a lot of people don't know about, you know, because let's face it, not very many people are nuclear engineers and, <laughs> you know, work at nuclear power plants and all that kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, they might have read a couple of articles here or there about, you know, certain things like especially what happens when an EMP hits and um, and and then maybe the author of that article was you know more of a doomsday guy somebody who was trying to spread fear and, and those kind of things um, hey what's going on William um, and it's, it's really, it's, it, you don't really, you shouldn't ever operate from a position of fear based only, you know what I'm saying? You should really try to operate from a position of just understanding um, what the situation is and all that kind of stuff and, and what the reality is of what happens. Um, so, and, and there's, you know, there's approximately 98 or 99 um, nuclear reactors in our country. I think more than 80% of them are light water reactors. Uh, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and they all have a lot of safety features and I'm going to talk about those primarily seven main points we'll talk about. But uh, before I get into that, I think the, the thing that most people are worried about is what happens if there is a cyber attack on the grid or if there is a high altitude nuclear detonation, and uh, that causes an EMP, which is an electromagnetic pulse. Um, and they, you know, these, these nuclear power plants lose power. What happens then? You know, are they going to go into meltdown mode? So uh, the people that design these things are, like I said, they're, they're super smart. And they actually drill and practice for these things, these exact kind of scenarios all the time. Um, and so with that, let's go ahead and let's go ahead and get into this a little bit here. Um, all right. So I kind of I kind of just referred to this. Um, the, the plant operators trained to handle these problems frequently to include uh, training for total power loss due to an EMP and a CME. Um, they have multiple redundant backup power systems um, so that. If the main grid goes down, they can um, continue to have power, you know, right away. Um, and that, that includes um, different kinds of, sorry, my dogs were over here. <laughs> different kinds of um, backup power, including, you know, generators, diesel generators and all that kind of stuff. And it has been noted in uh, trainings that they have and stuff like that, that those, that those systems need to also be hardened. Uh, if you if you Google, you can you can see the results of some of these trainings, and kind of get an idea of what it is that they do, uh, you know, to practice for them and all that kind of stuff. And you can see some of the findings of the uh, of the different exercises that they've done, and it's kind of interesting. So they um, they've got redundant power backups. All right. They also have manual shutdown procedures that are available. If there is no power at all, if they can't use their backup power for whatever reason, all the plants have manual, um, uh, systems in place so that they can shut down the actual fission that's going on. 
And um, and this can this can happen in just a few seconds. It does not take a lot of people think that it takes a really long time to stop the fusion process, but that's not actually true. It can be done in a few seconds. And but then the, the part that's after that is, is that the fuel rods will take uh, multiple days and or potentially even weeks to cool themselves down. But you can they can stop the fission process, which is 94% of the heat that, that is being made. Uh, and they can, they can cut that down really, really, really fast. Okay. So <laughs> you don't have to listen Mac today. You can, you can go somewhere else. If you don't, if you don't want to listen, that's fine. Um, but anyway, uh, the point is, is that, um, they can shut this stuff down really fast. All right. Now the problem that you have to worry about then is the cool or the uh, fuel rods and the fuel rods have also have multiple things in place um, to take care of this. So, and you have to, you, you basically, they have to go into a cooling pool, the, the, in, in a light water reactor anyway. Um, and so they still have to, to keep to stay cool because even though it's only six percent it can still be enough um that it could boil the water off and then they could go critical so uh most all of these plants are built close to rivers and or very large bodies of water and they're built in such a way that the containment facility uh that they're that they're held within is actually lower than the the level of the water and that way uh it can be flooded if need be. So if there is a critical malfunction that they can't control or something along those lines, then they can flood the containment facility, which is going to keep the cool, the rods cool. Okay. <clears throat> all right. Um, also all of the nuclear power plants in the United States are covered with a reinforced steel and concrete containment unit. That is very, very heavy duty. Um, they are built, to a spec that is supposed to withstand a commercial airliner crashing directly into it. And depending on the sources that you read, the containment um, buildings are made of steel and concrete, and it can be uh, the walls are up to six feet thick with dome ceilings. Um, and the whole purpose of that is, is that if this manual shutdown, um, you know, doesn't, doesn't work right or something goes wrong, there's a catastrophic failure or something like that. And the, the uh, fuel rods start to um, go critical, then what'll happen is they'll, they'll drop further into the water and they'll go down onto a, like a, I think it's a six to eight inch stainless steel plate. And they do that so that that, the, that big plate, that, that a mass of steel that large can hold a whole lot of heat and it'll transfer the heat into that. And then if it, um, if it continues to melt even through the steel plate, then it, then there's like three or four or five feet of concrete. I don't remember what the number was, um, several feet of concrete. And it's the same kind of thing. It's a big heat sink. And then if it goes through that, then it'll end up going down into the dirt. And at that point, then that's when the facility can be flooded and they'll just cover it over with water. So um, even if there is a, a catastrophic meltdown and the containment structure is still in place, then there you're basically, uh, if you live within um, five miles then of, of the, of the reactor facility, then they expect that you would, they would probably evacuate you. Um, and that's just in case that you received you know, some higher amount of elevate of, uh, of radiation within 10 miles. They say that you'll probably be able to detect it, but it's still going to be a safe level. It won't be a problem. Um, so, you know, it's, it's not like a, a lot of people think that, you know, if you live 50 miles from a nuclear reactor or something like that, that you have to worry about it. It's really only those people that are within five miles that could potentially have the, the, um, uh, evacuation happen if it went critical. Now that's never happened in the history of this country. Uh, we've, we've had one level five incident and that was at three mile Island. Nobody died. 
Uh, we've never had a level seven incident at all. And that's, that's the highest level. Um, and that's because we have so many redundant things in place. Now, Chernobyl was, uh, was basically the stupidity of, of the people that designed the place because it didn't, they didn't ever have uh, when it was, when it was constructed and when it went critical, it didn't have a containment facility around it. They had to go back later and build a containment facility around it. Okay. So that was not smart. And with Fukushima, um, that was a pretty extreme situation. The earthquake that caused Fukushima was a 9.0 on the Richter scale. Um, and you know, then it caused the, the tsunami and all that kind of stuff that caused damage there. So, you know, it, it's, it's just, those are the three primary incidences that have happened. Uh, but overall nuclear, nuclear power is very safe. And especially in a situation with like an EMP, um, even if the power backup power didn't work, the people at the plant are still going to have plenty of time to, um, to shut it down, to shut down the fission of it, you know, and, and start the cooling process and all that kind of stuff. So it's, it's really not something that you have to get super crazy about and, and worry about a whole lot. Um, there's, there's just, there's just not that big of a, you know, worry about it. Now, if it was a all out nuclear exchange and, you know, nuclear bombs started dropping on top of nuclear power plants. Okay. Well, that's a pretty bad situation. <laughs> All right. But the, the likelihood of something like that happening is extraordinarily low. Uh, it's, it's very, very low. So um, we don't have to worry about that. Hey, what's going on, Tammy? So um, let's see here. So I wanted to go over some questions that people had. If you guys have any questions, want to talk about this or whatever, um, just stick it in the uh, chat and try to um, try to make it all caps or something like that so that I can see it and um, and then I'll do my best to answer it. All right. So Tim Colgan asked, uh, will a lead blanket stop an EMP? So I assume what you're talking about, Tim, is like taking a lead blanket and putting it over the top of your electronics of some sort, um, you know, like a solar generator or something like that, or radios or whatever the case may be. And that would not work. And the reason that would not work is because you need, if you can Google the skin effect and that'll give you an idea of what you need um, to, to basically create a Faraday cage. And essentially what that is, is you need to have a conductive material going all the way around the object that you're trying to, to uh, protect. And you need to make sure that all the seams and everything like that are all very consistent um, and, and conductive along the seams. Because if not, then what happens is that that energy will kind of dump into the seam area. So if you just had a lead blanket laying over the something, um, it's going to basically it's going to penetrate from underneath it. All right. So it's not going to it's not going to protect it. Okay. All right. Let's see what the next one was. Okay. So Denise B, new subscriber. Thanks for subscribing. She says, uh, what is the best gas mask to wear? Uh, what can we do to help our pets be safe since they can't wear one? So, Okay. It all depends, right? So as far as gas mask goes, uh, Mira Safety is probably the the company that I'd recommend the most. Um, they sell new gas masks um, to people direct to the you know citizens and all that kind of stuff. I have an affiliate link to them down in the description below if you want to check them out. Um, they make pretty good products. I'd recommend the one with the full open face shield. But here's the thing. You don't necessarily need a gas mask. Um, if you, you can wear an N95 mask, that's fine. Um, you just need to make sure that it's fitted to your face and it actually fits well, uh, because if it doesn't fit, then you could potentially, you know, breathe in fallout. But it's also important to remember that you don't really even need to wear a mask, um, unless you're outside of your shelter. Uh, while you're inside your shelter, you shouldn't, there shouldn't be any reason why you have to have it on. The only time you would need to wear it is if you went out of your shelter for some reason. As far as the pets go, that's that's a pretty uh, pretty crazy situation because there's really not a lot of great answers. Um, if they're smaller pets, I know Mira Safety does make a 
Um, well, I mean, uh, I don't know. It wouldn't. It probably wouldn't work. <laughs> they they make a an infant gas mask chamber where you put the the baby inside the chamber, um, and you know then you can just breathe normally or whatever. Um, but uh, you know, for an animal, I can't see what circumstance they would need to be inside of that, right? Because if they're inside the shelter with you, then they're they're not going to really need to have a you know a gas mask or a respirator. Uh, if the animals can't come inside. Then about the only thing that you can do is is put them um, inside of a barn or something like that. Um, if you have a farm, you could potentially pile, you know, big round bales, hay bales, like, you know, three or four rows thick uh, all the way around the barn. And that would help some uh, just to help, you know, with fallout exposure. But hay and straw and that kind of thing is not a very good um not a very you know dense material and so uh, gamma radiation is going to go through that pretty easily so unfortunately there's not a whole lot that you can do for that situation um so this is mushroom hunter uh, was commenting on a video i did on Far faraday cages a couple years ago and he said if you already wrap the items in foil then is the metal container just an optional precautionary measure Thanks for the video. So yes, it's essentially redundancy. They call that a nested Faraday cage. And the idea behind it is, is that if you have multiple layers of different material, then that will reduce, each, each layer reduces a certain amount more of, um, of voltage, for lack of a better word. Um, and so if you have three or four layers, then you're, it's going to be more effective than just one layer. All right. So that's the, that's the basic idea. Hey, Billy, thanks for watching. Girls, what are you doing? Girls, be good. <laughs> All right. So let's see what the next one is. Uh, okay. Here's, this is another one that I'm getting a whole lot of uh, lately. And, and it's, I live in a, I live in a mobile home. 15 foot wide mobile home, you know, like a single, single wide mobile home. That's what I grew up in. <laughs> um, and I'm screwed. Uh, multiple comments that are variations of that whole, that whole thing. Um, so here's the thing. If you can't safely take shelter in your house and we should point out while we're doing this again, I do, I say this every video, but uh, girls settle down. Settle down. Come here. Be good. Be good. You girls be good. Okay. Um, hello. Hello. Okay. Go lay down. <laughs> Go lay down. So um, the likelihood of anything like any kind of nuclear war or anything like that happening is still extraordinarily low. I mean, it's way better than 95% that it's not going to happen at all. So please do not start freaking out about this. Start racking up a bunch of debt, buying stuff or making crazy modifications to your house and all that kind of thing. That is not, that is not required. <laughs> it's, it's really not. Um, if I was in a, if I was in a um, trailer house, what I would do is I would do a little recon around my area and I would try to find something that's within 15 minutes of my house that of a building um, public or private or whatever that um, that has a good basement in it. That's what I would, that's what I would do. And then if worst case scenario actually did happen and bombs, you know, started falling, then I would go to that building. I would have the tools with me that would, you know, help me make entry into that building. And then I would stay there and I would have a bug out bag and all that kind of stuff that I need would need with me. And I would just stay there. That's what I would do probably. Uh, if you don't have a friend or a family member who has a good basement, you know, if, if you have, um, yeah, it, Tammy, it's not at our doorstep. <laughs> All right. It's, it's really not. I, I promise you it's Russia is making moves and Europe is, uh, 
Europe is doing what they can to stop that. And this fight is probably going to continue for a little while, but that doesn't mean that it's going to go nuclear. All right. And if it, even if it did go nuclear, it doesn't mean that it's going to come here per se. All right. There, there is um, just as much expectation that if it did go nuclear, that it could happen within the theater with a small tactical nuclear, nuclear device or something like that to basically tell NATO, Hey, back off. I'm serious here. And I'm not, I'm not going to be screwed with. And you know, I'm, I'm not going to be uh, dissuaded from this, from this special military mission that he's conducting. Um, but it's, there is the, the one constant thing that I always tell people, and I feel like it's a hundred percent true is that the one constant thing you can always be sure of is that people who are in power are going to always want to stay in power. And Vladimir Putin is not an idiot. He knows that if he sends a nuke over here, that he is no longer going to be in power and his country is going to be decimated. All right. They have, they have a first strike advantage because of hypersonic missile technology, but they have zero capability to stop any of our incoming ICBMs. So it doesn't even matter if they do strike first because we have the ability to launch regardless. All right. So mutually assured destruction is still very much in play and it does not uh, just go away just because people start fighting. I mean, we've, we've fought multiple proxy wars with Russia through other countries in the past. So it's not, um, it's, it's not as if this is the first time that we've ever had a conflict with Russia. Okay. Uh, it's, it's happened. So, Okay, this other one was uh, was an interesting one. Let me see if I can get it to pop up here. Ah, come on. So the guy is Felix Adventures, and he said, "Hi, I'm across the pond in in, in Australia, in Sydney, to be exact. Not sure if if it's a target area, but I had a look throughout my house and found a medium sized room that's reinforced with double brick." but I also wanted to reinforce it with concrete and metal sheets and my house is on sand. So it would be easy to dig down. Uh, my house is an old 1930s. Uh, it has some asbestos. I'm still young and quite worried about it, but my parents and no one else seem worried about it. I have ideas, but I'm not allowed to take them into action. What should I do at this point? I'm about at the five PSI range from where the bomb I think uh, would be dropped. And if Sydney was the, was the place, you know, the, the ground zero said, I need help as I'm quite worried about this and have a perfect storm and could dig down, but I don't have permission from my parents. What should I do? So first off, um, I don't know how old you are, but you know, obviously if you're living in your parents' house, you need to respect their wishes and you need to listen to what they're saying. Um, but if you've got a room that's double brick layered already, you probably don't need to do too much more than that, especially if it's in the middle of your house. Um, you're, you're probably going to be pretty good to go in that area. So I wouldn't consider, I wouldn't worry about it too much. Something that you could do on your own is probably put together a good uh, bug out bag or a fallout bag, whatever you want to call it, and just have some stuff put together that you can, um, you know, that you'd be able, you know, like some basic food and water and some pretty, you know, limited sanitation materials and stuff like that. But the good thing is, is that it's it's also pretty unlikely that Sydney would ever be a target in a nuclear exchange. Um, I, I don't see that Australia is probably going to be, you know, really getting in this conflict in any way, especially in any way that's going to really irritate Russia to the point where they're going to lob a nuclear bomb down that way. That just doesn't make any sense to me. So um, I think you have a very good chance of not ever having any uh, any situation to deal with in, in this, in this nuclear thing. Primitive X. That's correct. That is the term that they use. They would scram. And basically that's just stopping the fission. And they, there's two different ways from what I understand that light water reactors can do that. They can interject the cooling rods, uh, immediately into it. And that, is uh, pretty well guaranteed to stop it. And if even if that didn't work, then there's some sort of a fluid, and I don't know what kind of fluid it is, but they can inject that into the pool, and that essentially stops the you know the molecular exchange that's happening there. It makes it 
you know, so that it's not real conducive for it to happen. Um, so yeah, there's, there's lots of different things that, that they can do to keep those, keep them from going critical. All right. Uh, let's see, let's see, let's see. If you guys got any other questions, let me know. We'll probably try to wrap it up. I'm going to look back here and see if I missed anything. So, so William uh, Gibson, you said you live within three miles of a power plant. What I would just do is, um, a, you could you could stop by and talk to somebody at the facility and see if they would give you a call to talk to you about what the emergency plans are. Um, the other thing, what are you doing? <laughs> Dogs are getting into everything. Um, the other thing that you could do is just make sure that you have a plan to be able to evacuate just in case there is a situation. Um, my guess is is that um, they probably have you know frequencies that they would broadcast on and all that kind of stuff. Um, if you can find out that information from them, then you could probably, um, you know, kind of keep, keep that up and going at any period where you think it's a heightened alert, but mostly just have a bug out plan in case you needed to leave where you would go, who you would stay with, maybe, you know, pre-position some supplies with those people or something like that. If you wanted to, if you trust them and everything. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, you do really don't need to worry about too much. Honestly, I mean, I, I, it's a very low likelihood that something's going to happen uh, at the plant near your house. All right. Yeah, Leatherneck Prepper says, don't prep because you're scared. Prep so you don't have to be scared. And that's exactly the right attitude. If you guys aren't subscribed to Leatherneck Prepper's channel, you should go check it out. He makes all kinds of videos. He's doing a good job. He just started his channel not too long ago, and he's trying to trying to grow it. All right. Having a plan is important, David. That is correct. Yeah, 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 Jared. <laughs> I'm, I'm not trying to. Uh, I'm not trying to be super, super scientific in this in this presentation. I know molecular exchange isn't necessarily the right right terminology, but I'm just I'm just trying to say the fission process, you know. So, and it's been a long day, so give me a break, all right. <laughs> I know you're some kind of a chemical engineer or something like that, but you know that's that's not me. We're just talking about the nitty gritty. Yeah, Tony, uh, an emergency radio is a great thing to have. Um, I just picked up uh, a different one the other day, too. It was a uh, CC Crane one. I'll show it to you guys in a future video here where it's got uh, um, multiple different bands and stuff like that that you can listen to. And um, it's real small and, and you know, kind of compact and all that kind of stuff. So uh, it's a good thing to have, you know, just especially after a... Um, after if there was a nuclear detonation or something along those lines or in, you know, um, well, if it was an EMP, you're probably not going to get too much over the radio except for on the short wave bands, which are, you know, international uh, in nature or um, on the ham bands, uh, maybe public or broadcast ones, uh, depending on where you're at and all that, if they have the infrastructure in place, but uh, being able to listen, um, on a radio is probably going to be one of the best ways to get uh, information after a you know serious critical disaster like that. So, all right, guys, if you guys don't have anything else, I'm going to hop off here. That's all the major items I wanted to cover. Uh, and I don't want to keep you guys on here just blathering on. So if you got any questions, throw them in there. If not, then I will get off here. Uh, I will let you know. Um, okay. So Tony asks, um, does a bow and arrow system have any place in a serious survival kit? I go both ways on that. So Tony, um, I wouldn't call it a, a piece in your survival kit. Uh, if you are an archer and you know how to use the bow and arrow, um, it's a very effective hunting tool. Uh, but you do need to practice that ahead of time because it isn't just real easy to get out there and go do it. But with, you know, two dozen arrows, um, you know, and, and uh, say maybe a few more broadheads than that, maybe three dozen or so broadheads, 
you could definitely hunt for many, many years and be able to go out and get a lot of large game and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so they're, I'm not, I'm not saying they're bad. Uh, if you're going to get a system, I would, I would, um, <laughs> you're an idiot leatherneck. <laughs> um, I would recommend getting a small compound bow setup. You know, you don't need to get a really high weight one or anything like that. It doesn't need to be a 70 pound draw, 50, 55 pound draw is more than ample to take down really probably all the way up to elk. I don't know. Um, so I think that uh, it can be a useful tool, but you do need to know how to use it, I guess is my advice on that. Hunt Outdoors says, thoughts on those who swear by a mag or a tribe, and are you in a mag or a tribe? Is that, ne is that necessarily your opinion? So I just did a video on this not too long ago, um, which basically I said, don't join a group. I think that's a bad idea, but you should go check out that group or check out that video to understand the reasons why. Um, what I think is better option is uh, make a group. And it doesn't have to be a formal group, but get your friends and your relatives and your neighbors and the people around you to start understanding why it's important to, you know, to be at least somewhat prepared. And uh, I will say that I have I have recommended these books to you guys uh, several times. I think it's really important that you read them. Um, Peter Zehan, Z. E I H A N, I believe is how he spells his name. He's got three books. The first one is uh, Accidental Superpower. The second one is called Absent Superpower. And the third one is called Disunited Nations. And I've just been reading all three of these just over the last week or so. And they have really changed um, the way that I view what's happening in the world and why all the things are happening like the great reset and, and, and all this kind of stuff, because, um, I think the easiest thing I could say to you is just go read the books so that you can understand it. Cause it's too much to get into here. Um, but ultimately many countries in the, on the planet are heading for a demographic collapse, which means that their economy is also going to collapse. At the same time, the United States is going through a deglobalization effort. I know everybody talks about the one world government and globalization and all that kind of stuff. But the, the reality of the situation is, is that we're actually pulling back on our Bretton Woods agreement. And we are not going to be uh, as globally involved as we have been. And there's tons and tons of reason for this. Um, and it all is very, very logical and it makes perfect sense now. I'm not saying that the World Economic Forum is not trying to pull and consolidate Europe together in preparation for some of these countries that are going to collapse. That's what they are doing. Um, and a lot of people like to, to say that it's going to happen here in America as well and all that kind of stuff. But the reality of the matter is it's not it's not going to. Um, so. The next uh, arguably the next six to eight years are going to be pretty bumpy. I'm not saying that they're, they're, it's not going to be bumpy, but America is positioned in a very, very, very good position, good place all the way around to come through this um, even stronger than we are now, really. So I, I would love for you guys to read that book, especially if you're somebody who deals with a lot of stress and you are worried, you feel like there's impending doom and that, you know, things are going to fall apart all the time. If you always feel like that, these books will really help you to see things through a much clearer lens. And so I highly, highly recommend that you read them and, and it's, they're geopolitical in nature. So if you're, if you're not into, um, you know, that kind of thing, uh, it, it might be, you might have to kind of concentrate when you listen to it because it's not like just a story or whatever, or if you read it, I, I listen to them. Um, but, uh, man, they're just, it's filled with a ton of information. And the cool part about this is, is he, he was dead on in 2014 when he wrote the book, the accidental superpower, he said that 
here's the reasons why Russia will go into the Ukraine full on by 2022, no later than. And, and he, he called it then in 2014. And he was right. Now, the scary part about that is, is that he's, you know, uh, fairly confident that he's all, they're also going to go into Latvia, Lithuania and Estonia. But um, that doesn't necessarily mean, and I know NATO article five and all that kind of stuff. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that the United States is going to be heavily involved in that conflict. So spin down off the chair a little bit. <laughs> so the name PJ EQ, the three name, the three books is called, the first one is accidental superpower and they're all by Peter Zion, Zihan, Zihan, Z E I H A N. So accidental superpower, then it's the absent superpower. And then it's disunited nations. If you only want to read one, just read the most recent one, which is disunited nations. But uh, all three of them lay a great groundwork for why our economy is so strong and how there's really nothing that these politicians can do to screw it up as hard as they've tried and as hard as they will continue to try. The uh, politicians, uh, just the momentum and the gravity of our economy is way more than they can, than they can tear down. Um, so it's, it's really, really a fascinating read. And I, it was just, and I, and I've been in counterintelligence for 20 years. I'm pretty worldly and I under, understand a lot of things about how the world works, but he puts it together in a way that, you know, kind of has always floated around in my head, but I never could really articulate and could, couldn't could say well. Um, but yeah, it's really, really good stuff. Okay, um, let's see here. <laughs> Morris Venture said he had some bad pot and hallucinated that there was an attack on U.S. soil. <laughs> you say no to drugs, man. <laughs> Uh, let's see, hunt outdoors, family, and a few friends, not hard, fast, stringent requirements of rules, then I am much the same thought. Yeah, pretty much. So possibly, uh, PJ EQ says, can life in a condo building be considered safer than a freestanding single family unit? Okay, so it, it kind of depends, right? It depends on um, how many, how tall is the building, how wide is the building, all those kinds of things. Um, you know, if it's a fairly large condo, if you can get, to, you know, if it's, say, five, six stories tall, which most condos are only two or three, um, then that one would probably be fine if you could get to like the third floor in the center of the building and then build up a bunch of mass around you, then that would probably be okay. Uh, it would be better than being in a single family home on a foundation where there's no basement for sure. Um, but it, it all depends. I mean, if you go through that playlist of series and, and kind of listen to the, the different, um, key concepts that I'm trying to explain to you guys in these videos about fallout, then you're just going to have to apply those concepts to your situation because I'm given very general, very general kind of like, you know, things. Yeah. Uh, Utah, Mike, exactly. It all depends on the yield of the weapon, where you are in relation to that, where you are in relation to the fallout, the kind of building that you're in, the structure that you have, there's just tons and tons of variables that I could never possibly, you know, go into entirely. Um, but if you understand the key concepts, then you can figure out how to, you know, build something that's going to work the best for you. Okay. What's going on, Kipper White? All right. Let me see what else we got here. Yeah. Leatherneck Prepper said he's been reading the, the Great Reset by Glenn Beck. Uh, you know, I listened to, to Glenn sometimes. Uh, but I tell you what, he's gotten a little, he's gotten a little doomsday here recently. And so I haven't been really listening to him too much. Um, because you know, he's, he, he's, he's missing a lot of things. I think I really do. Uh, and I, I like the guy, I think, you know, he's, he's a good talk show host and he's entertaining and all that kind of stuff. But I think that he's, um, narrowly focused on this, uh, world economic forum to a point that it's, 
uh, he's he's looking too specifically at that. He needs to widen the views a little bit. Yeah, Tony Wilson. Um, she says everybody says the Chinese has the upper hand, but if you look at recent Chinese market fluctuations, it's readily apparent the Chinese markets are still entirely dependent on the U.S. Mm -hmm more than you can even imagine. Those books that I was just recommending talk about that a whole lot. Um, they, without the, the Bretton Woods, if you guys were doing research, look at the Bretton Woods Agreement. And essentially the Bretton Woods Agreement was um, after World War II, the United States uh, got, I think it was like 40 or so countries at the time together. And they said, hey, uh, we will police the world's oceans your country will not have to develop a Navy and uh, we'll guarantee free trade with your countries, with whoever else in the in the world that you want to. And you don't have to, you don't have to escort your, cause see prior to that, if, if one country was going to trade with another, their navies had to go with those ships to keep them from being attacked and, you know, pirated and taken over by other countries and all that kind of stuff. And that was really what navies did. Uh, but that's, that's not the case. Uh, under the Bretton Woods Agreement. And so what happened was, is this allowed a magnificent amount of economic development all across the world that never would have been possible based on their geography. But uh, nevertheless, they, they have been able to expand. And China is one of those countries that has directly benefited from the Bretton Woods Agreement. And um, now that we're starting to pull back from that, they are going to face a uh, some pretty significant challenges. They also have a demography that is collapsing um, and their economy over the next 20 years is going to, is going to tank. They're, they're never going to be the world's number one superpower. They're never going to um, be the big dog on the block. They're just not, it's just not, it's not feasible. Okay. So Kipper says, uh, Bitcoin, good, bad, fugly thoughts. So um, for me, Bitcoin is kind of like gold and silver in that uh, I don't recommend that people put any investment into it unless they have all of their basic preparedness stuff all squared away. So like you should be out of debt. Um, you should have, you know, three months to however high you want to go worth of food. You should have some water and the ability to get water. You should have the ability to, to um, take care of medical issues yourself. You should have the ability to generate power and those kind of things. Um, have the ability to garden and, and provide for your own food, all that kind of stuff. And if you can handle all that stuff, if you feel like you're really squared away in those areas, you've got a good emergency fund set back where you can pay three to six months worth of expenses, then go ahead and think about doing some additional investments. Um, for me, I, uh, I try to avoid all the hype in Bitcoins and, 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 and different coins, this coin and that coin is going to be the next big one and all that. Cause almost all of them go through a pump and dump cycle, you know? Um, but what I do is, is when the coins are new and they're still low priced, you know, less than 10 bucks, then I'll buy a handful of those coins and just hold on to them and kind of forget that I have them basically. And then if some of them hit and they, you know, jump up way up in price or whatever like that, then I can make a decision if I, if I want to sell or something, but ultimately it's more of a long-term thing for me. And then, you know, maybe 10 or 20 years down the roads, so we'll look at them and see how much is there kind of thing. Um, I don't personally, um, I don't personally stock silver, stack silver or gold or any of that kind of stuff because I don't think, um, based off of experience that I've seen in third world countries when they're in collapsed economies, nobody uses it. Um, barter happens all the time, but nobody uses gold and silver when there's a collapsed economy. I think it's a, it's a farce. It, and it's, it was started by James Wesley Rawls in the Patriot series. He went into this, you know, this whole thing about how that's going to be, that's going to happen. But the problem is, is that with his thesis is that there's not, there's simply not enough junk silver on the economy, in the economy, to to be a medium of trade, you know. I mean, that's why we don't have the gold-backed dollar anymore, because there wasn't enough gold on the planet, <laughs> you know. So, um, I, I don't, 
I, personally, I don't, I don't do all that stuff. Um, I think if you're going to, if you're going to stock something up, stock up some ammo because ammo will always be valuable no matter what. Uh, and not even just for conflict reasons. It's just, it's just a valuable commodity because it doesn't, it doesn't degrade. It doesn't go bad. I mean, I've shot ammo that's over 50 years old and it's still fine. So, um, that's, that's a good one. Uh, investing in food and having a good food supply and all that kind of stuff. is just good. It's good insurance, you know? So that's, that's kind of my thoughts on it. Hey, Denise, uh, I answered your question earlier, I think. Didn't I? Let me look. So let me make sure. <laughs> yeah, I did. Okay. Let me see if there's any other questions in here. Um, Oh, I think you had one other question that I didn't address. Oh, yeah, you were asking. Uh, Denise asked if you if her dogs could take uh, iodine, and I don't know the answer to that. Um, I'm not even sure if they have a thyroid, <laughs> so I would talk to the vet probably. That's the best thing I can give you. The other thing you said in here in your question was. Um, you talked about mobile homes, so I addressed that one already. So if you just got in here, then you may want to go back and review that answer. Um, you also you talked about putting thick pieces of plastic over your windows. That isn't going to do anything to protect you from gamma radiation in a trailer house. Um, it's going to keep fallout dust from coming inside, but the problem is, is that uh, the gamma emitters it'll protect you from alpha and and and. Well, it wouldn't protect you from beta, but it would protect you from alpha. There's th three primary kinds. And Jared's going to give me a hard time here, but there's three primary kinds of radiation fallout that you got to worry about. It's alpha, beta, and gamma. There's also x-ray and neutrons and all this, but those are the three main ones you got to worry about. Um, alpha can be stopped with as little as like a sheet of paper. Beta uh, can penetrate... Um, I've seen I've seen different things. I, I've seen some stuff suggesting it could be up as, as, as much as 10 feet. I don't think that's accurate uh, because when it comes to absorption in the human body, it only goes to the subcutaneous fat, basically, you know, in your skin, like down below your skin. It doesn't even get to your to your muscle and, and your bone. Uh, but gamma radiation does. Gamma radiation can penetrate through a lot, uh, a whole lot. And so you want to use time, distance, and shielding to try to stay away from gamma radiation, if at all possible. Um, time, you want to try to stay in shelter for the minimum of two days, 48 hours. That's the bare minimum. Uh, after 48 hours, if you needed to go find a new shelter, you could, but uh, you really should try to stay sheltered as long as two weeks. Then with distance, you would like to try to get at least 10 feet from the, the point sources of the fallout, which is you, primarily the edges of your house. Think of it that way. Um, and if you can get at least 10 feet in, that's great. If you can only get nine or eight, then that's fine too. And these are general principles that we're talking about here. Um, and then with shielding, you just want to pile as much mass up around you as possible. But again, I could tell by your comments, you were typing in all caps. You were really fired up and worried about this. You really don't need to be that worried about this. Okay. I think in the next 24 months, what, what folks should really pay attention to is gas prices, storing some extra gas, having gas around because it's real possible. We could see some gas shortages um, and, um, and food shortages and making sure that you've got plenty of food, making sure that your pantry is full, that is going to bite you a whole lot quicker and uh, at a higher probability than, you know, thinking that, um, that we're going to have a nuclear war. All right. The only reason that I've been talking about, uh, that I've been talking about this nuclear stuff is because a, I hadn't had the opportunity to do it before and B, everybody wants to hear about it. So, <laughs> so that's what we're talking about, but it's not because I think that it's going to happen or that it's, you know, any kind of a, whew, got a storm rolling in or that it's any kind of a likelihood that it's going to happen. Oh, Jared. Thank you, Jared. Correcting me two sheets of paper, whatever you dork. <laughs> um, now the, the dogs are sitting right next to me now because they just heard lightning and thunder. <laughs> Firebugs. Firebugs. 
What are you worried about? She gets scared when it rain when it rains. Um, all right. So Morris Ventures channel says I can stay home, but I would live in a poor rural area and I'm sure people would try to break in. Well, if they do, then that's why you need to have some ability to defend yourself, you know? All right. <laughs> Morris says, how do I get rid of bad gas? I mean, just, just, are, are you talking about like you got a fart or do you mean <laughs> like for your car? Um, I mean, I don't know. It depends on how bad you're talking about, you know. I mean, um, a lot of people say, like I've heard a bunch of people say that um, that gas only lasts for six months, you know, and all that kind of stuff. And that's generally speaking not true. If you store it in a, in a, in a decent container somewhere that's not in direct sunlight um, and you put a stabilizer in it, you should be able to get even two years out of even even gas without with ethanol in it. Um, should be able to last a couple of years. All right. It doesn't even help in the fire pit. <laughs> well, that's pretty bad. <laughs> that's, that's definitely terrible gas. If you can't even get it to burn, I'd just dump it out somewhere then. I don't know. Um, yeah. So, so here's my CLM says NATO countries are showing an increasing willingness to intervene. They are meeting next week to discuss. I think we're closer to nuclear war than people uh, can admit to themselves. Well, first off, you have to understand, like I've said earlier in the, in the stream here, just because there's a war doesn't mean that it has to be a nuclear war. Okay. I understand we can all, we can all come up with plausible scenarios as to why it might happen, but the bottom line is, is like I said, these people who are in power want to stay in power. Um, my personal opinion is that the NATO countries do want the war. And the reason they want it is because they want to convince all the countries in Europe to come together under the United States of Europe. Now, I don't think they'll be successful in their desire to do that. Um, but Macron, uh, the French, what is he, president or prime minister or whatever he is, he is openly called for um, the countries of NATO to unite under one military. And uh, I think they do, many of the big players, you know, Germany, um, France, Spain, you know, I, I think they do want to see the conflict happen, uh, as crazy as that sounds. And But here's the thing. Russia, aside from the nukes, Russia is way weaker than people think they are. They, they, they are, they don't have a, a lot of staying power in this fight. So, um, and I think that most of the NATO countries know that, but I might be wrong. I, I fully admit that I could be wrong, but I do, I do tend to, to believe uh, Peter uh, Zihan, uh, guy that wrote those books earlier, I, his justification makes perfect sense to me. Um, and I think that I hope he's wrong, but it probably the, the conflict is probably going to expand. But again, that, that does have to be nukes. It's, it just doesn't. Yeah, CLM. That, that's I kind of talked about that earlier. If if it was going to happen, if there was going to be an exchange, it's more likely that it's going to happen in theater than it would be here. Matt, what's going on? It's not a nightmare scenario, man. It's just another war. Chill out. <laughs> no, I mean, you know, it, it may not happen. I mean, there's there's probably multiple different possible outcomes, right? One potential outcome is this thing muddles on for a little while and Russia sees that it's not, that he's not going to be able to um, take Ukraine without a significantly larger presence. Um, and he doesn't have the resources to be able to get into that. So he tries to negotiate some, something that would be acceptable to him. 
uh, I'm guessing that probably looks like keeping the Donbass region and, you know, uh, agreeing on Ukraine uh, staying neutral. Now, if they can come to an agreement of what neutral means, that <laughs> that is uh, probably going to be the sticking point there because I know that Ukraine is going to want to stay armed, especially after this. Um, but if if Putin, if they can if they can figure out a way to give Putin a win, I think that he he could potentially take that and go home, wait a few more years, and then you know decide to go into uh, the Baltic area. Uh, I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. The the books that that Peter lays out in those in those books, you know, he he thinks that uh, retaking the former Soviet territories is key for their geography, and the reason is is because it essentially shrinks the the area that they have to patrol at their border down from about three thousand miles to about six hundred. And so it has to do with cost and the fact that his military is the Russian military in the next year or so is going to be halved because of all the old people that are retiring and they don't have any young people to replace him. And so their military strength is it's this is it like in, in the next 20 to 25 years or well, in his, in his opinion, he says ever he, he actually goes so far as to say that the Russian ethnicity is in the next 30 to 40 years is going to disappear from the planet. <laughs> that's how, that's how, how strong he is on it. I'm not sure if it's that bad. Um, but uh, his point about you can't change demographic numbers, right? When you have well over half of your population is getting to the point where they have to retire. There's nothing to change that. And if you don't have the bodies coming up underneath that, you can't just create 20 year olds or 25 year olds. It takes 25 years to do that. Um, so that's why he's saying that the timing, why it's happening now is because he knows that his military is getting smaller. So he has to do the attacks now while he has the bodies so that he can only have to, to basically worry about this 600 mile zone you know, of geography as opposed to the 3000 or so miles. Now, the one thing that he doesn't really take into account there, in my opinion, is um, he doesn't really take into account what it takes to occupy those those territories if there's an insurgency. Um, at least he didn't talk about that in the three books that um, that I'm reading now. Now he got he's got another book, the fourth book coming out uh, in June. So I'll be curious to see you know how he breaks it down because uh, the last one was made in 2020. So uh, it's it's a very interesting perspective for sure. Yeah, CLM, like I was saying, globalism is stopping. There is, it's undeniably true that globalism is not, uh, the, the, it's, it's dying. The, the Europeans are trying to coalesce a, an effort to keep Europe together because they know that if they don't, many of those countries, with the exception of France, are going to fall apart, essentially. France is really the only the only European country that's positioned well to be able to deal with all the deglobalization that is happening. Uh, everybody else is in trouble. Germany is in really bad shape. Uh, Britain, his his assessment is that in twenty years, Britain could actually be a state in the United States. That says we're in the third echo of the lost generation of World War II. If you're a male born in 23 in the Soviet Union, you only had a 20% chance to make it to 46. And and that's it was he talked about the hollowing out of their of their whole society, right? So you had World War One, which they got hammered, right? World War Two, they got hammered again. Then you come out of World War Two in the Cold War era, the there was a slight bump, but not much. Um, and then the Soviet Union collapsed and their, their population got hammered even again and their birth rate went down even further. So it's like they just Russia has had the, their geography is awful for, to, to maintain a country where the, where their geography is. It's why they've been invaded so many times because there there's just 
no good situation for anybody who ever runs that country. It's always going to be vulnerable. And his assessment is, is that you have to maintain a million man army to, to be able to um, keep the borders that, that they currently have, which they can't do. They can't physically do that. So uh, yeah, it's, it's a bad deal for them. And in Russia is the same way. There are so many countries across the world that are dealing with this. And that is why, because of, because of shale, uh, shale and fracking in America, we don't have a problem where we're reliant on foreign energy anymore. And so we are going to be pulling back more and more and more across the board. And we're not going to give a crap what happens in these other countries because we're going to be focused internally and worrying about our own stuff here because it just puts us in a better position. You know, it's, it's, it's not even a matter of choice. It's, it's, it will be a matter of necessity because when we could have $70 a barrel oil here, all we have to do is stop exporting, right? And just feed ourselves with oil. If he And the president can do this at any time. He can stop exports via executive fiat and our oil prices will go down. Now the rest of the country, because they're not getting Russian oil right now, and they're also, if they were also to be cut off from American oil and America refined products, then, you know, the price of oil globally is probably going to go over $200 a barrel or higher. Um, and we will do that eventually. It'll happen. Um, it, there's really, it's just a matter of how long, um, how long we hold out for it, but it'll, it'll, it's going to, it's going to happen, but maybe the next 12 to 24 months or something like that, gas prices are probably going to be high. We're going to have to be dealing with it just because of the green movement and, you know, on the left and all that kind of stuff. But eventually um, that's going to that's going to go away. That sentiment is going to go away when it hits everybody's pocketbook and it causes, you know, an economic drain. And then we're going to be like, OK, <laughs> we're done playing these games, you know. So that's what I think is going to happen. Uh, and I, I, I agree with his assessment of that. Yeah, Kipper, uh, I assume you're talking about the Wagner Group. Um, Russia, he says Russia appears to be going to, to mercenaries lately, which is the fall of the Roman Empire. Um, and and it, it just shows, you know, they're trying to pull in people from Syria. They're trying to, you know, use um, private contractors and all that kind of stuff or mercenaries, whatever you want to call them. Um, and it just shows that their, their military may already be facing – uh, too much of a hollowing out, you know, and he might have he might have waited too long. It, it's possible. All right, <laughs> Matt, you says Britain. You mean airstrip one? <laughs> yeah, I don't know for sure if Australia, New Zealand will be. There's he makes it. He makes a fairly good argument that um, that Canada. And at least Alberta could potentially uh, could potentially join the union um, because there's really no reason whatsoever for them to stay where they are with 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 Canada. Um, Mexico, I don't know, maybe um, probably not, but they're definitely going to be our biggest trading partner if they're not already. Um, yeah, Zeon. Yeah, he's he's a man, dude. Like he really understands this stuff, and he and he has an ability to put it in a way that makes you understand it. You know what I mean? Um, not too many other authors that I and I read probably seventy five to eighty books a year, um, but his his three books um, really really made sense to me. And, and just just trying to piece everything together that I'm seeing happening and then listening to the way that he lays it out. It's like, Oh, <laughs> you know, that makes sense. Yeah. It, it, the, see, oh, they're, they're going to keep trying. There's no question that you're going to try. They're going to try to use climate change and all that kind of stuff, but that's, that's so minor. Um, it, when you when you look at the macro levels of all the things that he's talking about, you can't politics is not going to change any of this stuff. Uh, it's it's way big. Uh, 
Um, so PJQ says, do I think that the communist influence over the U.S. will more likely increase or decrease from here? I think we're on a downhill slide. Like I think we've hit the pendulum and, and it's starting to come back to a little bit more of a rational position. But that doesn't mean that it's not going to swing this way and then swing back again. I think this is going to be a cyclical thing that happens over the generations. And we just have to deal with it each time that it pops its head up. You know what I'm saying? Um, but rational, rational discussion and explaining to people why it's bad is, you know, a, a really good recipe for fixing it. Um, and probably the most effectual thing that can be done is exactly what all the school board moms did. Get up off your butt and go run for public office. I don't care what party you are. doesn't matter to me. Just have a citizen-led government. People need to be involved in the government. The worst, absolute worst thing you can do is disengage from the process and think that your vote doesn't matter. Okay, there's 3,147 elections that happen every election season, all right? And, and be just because a few of them had irregularities um, does not mean that your vote doesn't count. It just means that you need to be more involved in those purple counties, especially so you can make sure that no fraud does happen. But if you're not willing to get up and be a part of it, then the thing, same things are going to keep happening over and over. All right. With Jared, I, 75 to 80, I listen to them. I don't actually read them. I, I have a long commute. <laughs> So, um, cause I live way out in the country. And so, uh, I, you know, I, I read, I, when I say read, it's, it's listening to, so I don't know if I can claim credit for that or not, but yeah, we don't really, uh, Erga 2016, we don't really want to buy Mexico. Mexico is, a, is it's, it's a really hard, it's kind of like Russia it's a really hard place to govern because of all the mountains and, and, the, and where the tropical areas are and the desert and all that kind of stuff. It's, it's really just, it'd be great if we're just trade partners with them. <laughs> yeah. Yes, Jared, that's a hundred percent true way of looking at it. Demographics and energy equal destiny. And I, I would throw in there uh, river systems and arable land. You throw those, those, those few things together and that has a very, very, strong pull on how you're going to place and rank within the world. Yeah, that's right. Leatherneck. He said, you let the libs take control of the local and then they end up getting the whole state. And that's what's happened in multiple places. So, all right, people. It's been over an hour. That's way too long. Nobody should have to listen to me for that long length of time. <laughs> so I appreciate you guys watching. Uh, I will, I'll throw out there if you're still concerned about, uh, you know, nuclear detonations and EMPs and all that, if you've got all your basics covered, then, um, have you thought about protecting your house and your vehicles from uh, electromagnetic pulse? You can do that with EMP shield. You can go to empshield.com, use the discount code reality survival, and that'll save you $50 per unit at checkout. I, would, I don't recommend that you do this unless you got your regular basic preps squared away. But if you're pretty good on that and you want to ensure that your vehicle runs, you know, so you can make it home. And then when you get home, you can start your generator <laughs> and have uh, all the electronics inside your house working, all that kind of stuff. EMP shield is the best way uh, to do it. Thank you, North Carolina farmer. I, I appreciate, appreciate you doing that. Um, but anyway, that, that is uh, to all the people who have bought them recently. I want to say thank you because that is the, the whole way that, that this continues going. Um, I don't make nearly enough money on YouTube um, to, to justify the time that I put into it uh, and using the affiliates and all those links are down in the description below. Um, that is how I keep it going because it's a business for me, right? I mean, it's, it's a, it's a side hustle, you know, and I use the business to basically help me get my preps all squared away and all that kind of stuff. So anyway, you guys have a great night and we'll see. I'm going to start trying to do these. I'm going to start trying to do these Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 8 PM Eastern standard time. Don't hold me to it if I don't do it, but I'm going to try. <laughs> all right. I'll talk to you guys later. Don't forget to live six Ps. Proper prior preparation prevents poor performance.
stay safe.